Crichton personal black box recording. Time unknown. Location unknown. Cause of accident unknown. Should someone find this recording, perhaps it will shed light as to what happened here. <laughs> the look of that opening sequence is fantastic. And that was done in a very small studio next, next door to the one we normally worked in. The good thing about it was we filmed outside, inside, like it wasn't done in a lot at the back of Shepperton, so it didn't look like we were on a little piece of scrubland at the back of Shepperton Studios. We actually turned the studio into an outside, you know, trees and hedges and stuff like that. You sort of think that when they're doing a kind of, uh, you know, body lying in mud, <laughs> that they would have polystyrene mud that would be all comfortable. But no. <laughs> Let's bring in some real mud for Robert. So I was lying in a kind of huge pile of earth with bits of grass stuck in it, with my sort of buried to the waist up so that they could have the fake legs coming out the front. Yeah, I've been more comfortable. <laughs> that entire sequence where he's crashed and removes his hand and the finger and eyeball is one of my favourite sequences that the effects crew have ever been involved in Red Dwarf. There was an extra prosthetic sort of eye cover with a blasted out eye with a bit of wire hanging out of it. So I only had one eye working. And then I had to do quite a lot of, you know, uh, talking and talking and prop work. <laughs> Stressful at the best times. That's the one with the hand, you know, in the boxes. <laughs> I love that hand. That was, and it worked. That was a real hand. That actually walked along on its own. It was fantastic, that little thing. There was a, a puppeteered version uh, that could be operated via rod and cables from off camera. And there was another one um, that was obviously a prop one that Crichton could pull the fingertip off, pull the eyeball out, click it all back together. Andy Bowman also then mechanised a third version of the hand, which was completely self-contained, turn it on, the fingers all start, you know, doing that, and then it was just pulled across set. It was a brilliant scene. We were typing messages to each other, you know. <laughs> When you rehearse and you don't, you just don't know how that's going to go. But play to the audience, it went through the roof, you know. I remember it's Danny and it's Danny and Craig, isn't it? They just but keep kept on going like this, and with enough cutaways, you can just speed it up so that it doesn't get boring. That had to be edited uh, for the audience to see before the show, um, and I said to her, "Hey, let's do this together." And she said, "No, no, no, I want to do it on my own." I shot it. I know how it all goes together, and I went. But usually I'm in the edit. And she said, no, 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 you, it'll be great, it'll be fine, just chill, it'll be fine, let me do it. So we then had the dress rehearsal uh, and the little film inserts are played in uh, just to get an idea of the timing and how the show all works. And that bit came in and just was just awful, just didn't work at all. And the cast were all going open mouthed looking at this. So I then had to, I, I said, look, let me have a play with that. And I took it and re-edited it during the uh, dinner break in time for the audience to come in. It was a big relief when, you know, it was shown and the audience actually was laughing. Uh, uh, it did turn out to be a funny scene, but it was a nerve bit nerve-wracking thinking, if this isn't funny, this is going to be Scrambled Egg City. The thing about me not having many lines is that I did six days of being at the studio like everyone else. So it uh, gave me lots of time to watch everybody else, really, and, uh, you know, to watch Chris being oiled. He's too keen to get his top off, I think, that man. He'd been working out for months for that scene, you know, cos he was a weed before that, and all of a sudden he takes his top off and it's Arnold bloody Schwarzenegger. I think I know the scene to which you're referring. <laughs> is it me, or has it suddenly got rather hot in here? <laughs> read the script and thought, I'm going down the gym. Oh, he's a cheating bastard, he is. I didn't obviously leap down to the gym and do sort of, you know, uh, sort of get my, those, one of those Charles Atlas sort of books out, you know, and drink lots of Complan and everything. I think he'd been ripping and buffing, because <laughs> he did look magnificent. I mean, he made quite a lot of confirmed heterosexuals get a little bit interested. I would have shot them. I had a, a fitness regime anyway, so... Uh... You know, that sort of, I, I was in a reasonable shape at the time. And one of, one of the girls that did the oiling is um, Sarah Stockbridge, who's Vivian Westwood's best model at the time. She's just enormous and glorious, and I think all the crew were fairly open-mouthed when she stepped on set. Eyes were definitely diverted to her, I think. And I think Chris was quite nervous about it as well at the time. Well, it was, it was all right as things go. You know, what did you do at work today, Daddy? You know, got oiled uh, by two attractive girls, you know. Um, that's, by any standards, is a decent day at work, isn't it, really? 
Um, but there were wood shavings in the oil because of the situation we were in. And so that was sort of, it became slightly sandpaper-esque after a while. Um, but, you know, I'm not really complaining. <laughs> Am I glad to see you? The self-loathing beast that, that is, is about to assault Chris when he's all oiled up it took hours and hours of, you know, and it was this incredible, it was like an alien monster. It was brilliantly done, but then they never actually, all you ever saw was the shadow. With the time restrictions they did, an amazing job. And, and with the, that particular uh, creature, when it was shot in uh, as a still frame, it looked terrific. But when it was animated, it didn't look so good. And as we know, I mean, even in the first Alien movie, um, there was very little Alien in because it was better what the audience imagined the Alien was doing rather than what the Alien was doing. It was designed as a full six-foot, puppeteered, partial animatronic creature. And ultimately, the, the full body version was only used to cast a shadow of the demon on a wall. That poor Alien. You know, he went home to see his Alien mum. I've got a part in Red Dwarf! Well done, son. <laughs> I'm really proud, man. I'm going to be in Red Dwarf. <laughs> no, you're not. You're just a shadow. We could have done it with a bit of cut-out paper. It's there. I mean, if it, you know, without without the build that we'd done, I think it would have been tricky to achieve all the shots. But no, at, at no point did did you ever cut back to see the demon in all its glory. I say, let's get into the jet-powered rocket pants and Junior Birdman the hell out of here. <laughs> Most people would recognise that costume from earlier series. Do you know that? You see, because it used to be black and white. And then Howard, you know, he's just sort of imaginative like that, you know. We had the zebra coat and I remember Jill, my assistant, and I think it was about four of us that the night before with about 40 uh, felt pens actually coloured it in because we tried to have it dyed and they, because they couldn't guarantee the fabric would take or that it would shrink or whatever. So we coloured it in, and to this day, <laughs> you can see it's close up, it's very shoddy. I think everyone actually liked the yellow better than the original. I mean, they loved the, the black and white one because of that great double scene doing the hand slap, where it was so featured. And, and because of that scene was so memorable, you know, when I slapped hands with myself, I thought the costume would be too memorable to actually change it. So when it came off, and you know, I was quite happy about that, and so was Howard. The outside scenes on Terraform were the first things I shot when I got the job. And um, I think Rob and Doug and I had decided that they had to be visually very sumptuous. And no one was tired because it was the first thing we shot. And um, we just piled a lot of time and energy and money and visual effects into it, and it really worked. I mean, I think it's, it is glorious. They were very keen from the production's point of view that this had flames belching out of the water and, and smoke drifting across and mist. So uh, Peter went out with um, a physical effects crew. I think James Davis was one of his principals on that one. Uh, and they rigged propane um, gas forks under the water. That's the first night shoot I can remember doing because um, I think we did some others after that, but that was a really crazy one. At that time, I couldn't swim. I still was a non-swimmer. I've learned since. It's very embarrassing. Having children and you can't swim, they do tend to mention it. But they're so game, that cast. They'll do anything. Seriously, they'll do anything. So I was quite nervous getting in this big boat in a heavy costume with a rubber head on, and there were lots of lovely frogmen in the water, <laughs> charming frogmen, who were going, you know, you're all right, Robert, don't worry. And I was a little bit nervous. We were in a boat... A supposedly at a gentle pace, Craig decides to light his cigarette on one of the burning fires on the lake. Don't go outside the flambeaux, just go in between them. Have you, got, have you got a light there to light that? And I'm getting the lads to row me close to the flames and they're going, why, why, why? And I get my cigarette out. And I light my cigarette out on one of these gas, thick gas blowers, you know? We went right over the flames, so there were flames coming all around with loads of people on the bank going, get away! Craig, 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 don't bugger about. <laughs> the boat starts rocking. Certain actors don't like water. Craig, I can't swim. Craig. 
Craig's enjoying it. And we're all thinking, hypothermia, hypothermia. Oh, I was um, I was a bit crazy in them days, but it was a... <laughs> it lightened the evening, because it was freezing as well, you know. I also think there was a fatal mistake of giving all the actors a, 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 a tot of rum to keep us going in the cold night, which for most adult males is absolutely f acceptable because they can deal with it, but I, you know, <laughs> I was immediately... <laughs> one little egg cup full of rum and I was all over the place. But it was very gorgeous and, you know, I think Peter Rag did all that lovely smoke across the river and we had um, stunt coordinators for all the sort of roundhead and cavalier scenes and it was great. It was huge fun. Have a good bit of that! Take that, self-doubt! <laughs> Die like the dog you are, mistrust! <laughs> Feel my blade loneliness. May your foulness rot in hell. Hugely extravagant. Tried to do the Three Musketeers, but bigger. I mean, the hats weighed a ton. They were so, so huge, they had to be, um, you had to put foam in them. Um, they kept slipping down over his eyes. You could, uh, you know, just ridiculous, but funny. In every situation like that in my career, I think, whenever I've learnt for lots of sessions and how to be, how to do sword fighting or stick fighting or anything like that, you know, in the edit, it's always looked as if I could have spent 10 seconds learning one particular stroke of the stick, because you actually never see much of it at all, you know? Um, and that was the same with the sword fighting, I mean, uh, you know, we, we did quite a lot of sort of try to learn the bits and in the end, you know, not much of it was used really.